going to start a little early today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Welcome to Hope City Church. Uh, we thank God that we could all be here today. I'm glad to see all of your beautiful faces. <laughs> Look forward to the worship. Um, in the back, right on the hand sanitizing in the mass table, there's a gift box. No pressure if you want to give to the ministry. We do give to global ministries and local ministries and churches. So if you want to give any amounts, you're all welcome to right at the back over there. There's some waters and some uh, snacks. I don't know really what the snacks are. I find it funny that it's mostly adults that take the snacks instead of the kids. <laughs> but, um, we got a good topic today, and uh, we look forward to this great worship team. So everybody praise the Lord. So if you can stand this morning, um, you know, stand up and worship the Lord with us. Um, again, I just as a reminder, as you know, I'm fairly new here and I'm playing songs that I've been playing for years. So if they're new to you, I apologize. But I just uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we just come to you this morning in Jesus' name and, and uh, just look to your, your word that says, you said, Jesus, that wherever two or three are gathered, gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. And we've come here for you. We've come here to hear from you. We've come here to praise and worship you in song. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that, that you just, in your faithfulness to us, uh, Inhabit the praises of your people this morning, and uh, you know what you know. Every heart, every life that's in here, what they're going through, um, the different circumstances and scenarios that of everyone sitting in here, and you died for each one of us this uh, in this place. So I ask that you would help us, Lord. You speak to our hearts, uh, speak to us what we need to hear from you. Give us a word of encouragement, Lord God. I pray. And may we be a blessing not only to you, but to each other. And embrace one another as, as you've instructed us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ as, as, as uh, something special. It's just say, Dion, pray for your blessings on, on the, not only the, the music, but also our, our pastor and, and, and his word that he's bringing forth this morning. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. sound guy. If I blast you out, there's nobody back here to turn it down. <laughs> we're, we're, we're praising God. So yeah. We're, we're so
some of you have been walking with the Lord. And to be honest with you, I was going to say I've been walking with the Lord for 41, 42 years, 43 years, somewhere in there since I was 23. And to be honest with you, there's been times when I wasn't walking with the Lord. I've always strived to. Sometimes I got discouraged because I didn't understand some things. And uh, what amazes me about our God is he never lets go. He never lets go. You can run as fast and as far and as hard as you want to from him. And he's always at the other end waiting for you. His love is higher than the mountains. It's deeper than the seas. The blood that Jesus spilled on the cross for us is an amazing, amazing love that we have never experienced on this side until we met Jesus.
prayer this morning, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, William. And how many guys love our worship team? Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. Yeah. I'm just trying to be crying before I start preaching. <laughs> anyway, before I start preaching, I want to start us off in prayer. So if you can buy here and close your eyes to me. Heavenly Father, we come before you in congregation for your name. In your name only. We ask that you anoint these lips of clay and that you speak through me and it's not just our own place that proclaims this message. We thank you for your wisdom, love, care, grace, and mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So this will be a part two series to the Elephant in the Room series. Uh, Jose and I got this idea when I was at his house and then we both got wide-eyed at sharing our subjects and you know, <laughs> your friend is that same stupid idea in his eyes. Uh, no. um, my topic today is going to be a kind of touchy one, but it's called the pedophilic agenda. Now, I want to show of hands to anyone who's heard about pedophilia as a topic recently. That proves this article. I'm going to read a quote from a news article about this subject. Listen to this. San Diego State University is teaching students that pedophilia could be merely considered to be an alternative sexual orientation. As an actual topic we discussed in class today at the State University, after watching an eight minute video of Vice News showcasing self-identified pedophiles. The photo shows a presentation slide entitled Pedophilia as a Sexual Orientation. It suggests that embracing pedophilia as an alternative sexual orientation could be part of the acceptance of diverse sexual identities. The Vice video showcasing pedophiles may well have been their platforming of Tom Todd Nickerson, a self-confessed pedophile. Vice's article about Nickerson sympathetically portrayed him an individual who openly admits wanting or desiring to molest children as a victim of right-wing vigilantes. Now before I take into this uh, horridness, let me define sexual orientation for you. A person's sexual identity as for their desire, I want you to keep that word in mind, desire. For example, bisexual, homosexual, pansexual, asexual, and 300 other sexuals they keep coming up with. And this is a trademark of what is called the LGBTQIA movement. Uh, I don't know what I and A stand for, but <laughs> I'm assuming that P will be one of their newest additions. So as I study this, I ask God, where is this stemming from? Where is this coming from? And he revealed to me in that moment, and uncrucified flesh is where all of this is sent from. We read in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Do we know why he said this? Do we know why he mentioned this? Taking up the cross means falling up to, cru to crucifixion. He knows what the flesh desires. Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Ephesians 4.22 You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. Colossians 3.5 Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You think God is trying to make a point here? You think God is maybe trying to communicate to us about desires of the flesh? The Church of Satan tweeted out, pedophilia is embraced in biblical um, theology, which I could go into, but that's a whole different subject. And many would say the Bible does not even condemn so why would we scream something about it? Well, let's look at this verse here. Matthew 18, 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, that would mean to sin, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. 
Do you know what you're doing when you get intimate with a 15 year old? Adultery. You are causing them to sin. You're causing them to be put in that death trap. We know God's hate for sin, but over and over in scripture, you can see examples of Jesus' love and intense care for his little ones. And combine that with his hate for sin, This is so evil and the abomination. And the and it's a direct affront to a holy God. Now God's grace is waiting for me. He's waiting for you, all right. <laughs> and they say, this is a common thing I heard. What if the what if both the child and the adult consent to this? Shouldn't it be okay? I'll ask another show of hands. How many of you wanted to do something when you were young that was just stupid but you didn't? Didn't know better. Yeah. They also say, I was born this way. Heard that argument? Even if the science was on that side, and I don't mean to come down harshly on people who struggle with this, and we need to stop pretending like our biological urges to do something justifies us doing it. This is literally the first thing we teach babies. Don't touch that. Don't plug the electrical cord. But don't touch the stove. Don't go over there. Don't talk to him. And don't do this. Don't do that. <laughs> and Kevin Arthur puts it this way. All you do to a two-year-old baby is look at me, look at me. No, what I say? No, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, what I No, ah, no, ah, no. Look at me, look at me, what I say? No. Uh, the doctrine of original sin is so evident in the child's young life. We don't teach the kids to do these things. They just do it. Many passages where God's love of his little ones is shown. There's a case where the disciples pushed away children that were trying to come to Jesus, saying that Jesus didn't have time for them. Stop putting your children towards him. And scripture says Jesus became indignant. He became infuriated with the disciples because of this. Let me read Matthew 17, 14 to 18, where a demon possessed little boy was brought before Jesus. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And do you know what Jesus says to his disciples? You unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. God hates the desires of pedophilia just like he hates all the evil desires. In fact, he, for lack of a better term, made the problem worse for us when he said, if you so much as look with someone for lust, you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. So he's showing us the reality of the law, that it's not just the act of it, it's the desire. Do you remember what we heard in those scriptures? You are to kill those desires. Now my second point. What I just iterated. God doesn't say ignore. Just ignore it. God doesn't say, just turn your face from it. God doesn't say, oh, scrape it off, get back to it later. What did he say? Kill it. Kill. Crucify. Nail it. Bury it. And never dig it up again. I also asked the Lord in trying to understand this. What does all this mean to us? What does this biblically mean to us? And the Lord revealed to me in that moment, as well as the other. This movement is an exact image of what happened in the garden. You want to know what the garden looked like? You want to know what happened there? Take a look at this movement. This movement is an exact image of the days of Noah. It's time we start taking Revelation and end times prophecy Seriously, because Matthew 24, 37 says that the days of the coming of the Son of Man 
will be just as the days of Noah. They laughed at Noah every single day. Uh, between 55 and 75 years is the time that Noah and his team had to build the ark. They laughed and indulged in sin until it started to rain. Adam and Eve died the day that they chose to go against God. And on the subject of died, I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 1, 3. As for you, it's talking about us, the world, you were dead. I have to pause there. You were dead. God threw me a lifeline while I was nearly drowned. You were already dead. And you know what this movement is? Dead? We want to say that way. We want to say in the grave, that song that William sung, I ran out of the grave, means nothing to us. We want to say dead in our desires and dead in our sin. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, the work of iniquity is already happening. It's not coming, it's already happening. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest who were by nature deserving of wrath. Isn't that just fascinating? By your fleshly and earthly nature, simply by that, you were deserving of wrath. Why do we need to crucify it? The ones who crucify the flesh are therefore exempt of it, and they stand holy before the righteous God. Amen. Now, progressive Christianity, uh, to give like a short definition of that, it's a whole other theological topic I could dig into, but. Progressive Christianity is those who claim we are gaining a higher understanding of God. They take biblical terms and uh, early church traditions and the things of apostolic authority, and they say, well, they really didn't mean that. Or, well, that was added in. That, that was taken away. They don't like Paul uh, pretty much at all. And they say, Moses didn't really write that. Uh, this was corrupted. Um, we accept these behaviors because the apostles didn't know what they're talking about. And this has largely to do with the wide acceptance of these types of behaviors. The early church knew about homosexuality. They knew the sin, they knew the nature of it. And yet, progressively, hundreds of churches today, what do they say? Of course, all are welcome at our church. Yet they affirm these behaviors. They distort the word of God to suit their fleshly desires. Now, what's the agenda here? Like I said, we're seeing a repeat. We're seeing a full-on circle from Genesis to Revelations. We're seeing a full-on circle of what happened in the garden, what happened in the days of Noah. It's happening right now. Now, there's no, there should be no bench warmers in the kingdom of God. Everybody on the field. So what's the next stop on this train? And the next stop means you better watch your children. Because Uncle Joe down the street just got told he doesn't have to fight those feelings. He can just live with them. They want to separate pedophilia from child molestation. Child molestation being the act, but pedophilia simply being the desire. You can't... Uh, punish or condemn someone because of their desires, then we know this is directly opposite and anti-gospel. This isn't new. As a point, I also wanted to stress that this isn't new. It's been going on behind the scenes in the works for centuries now, all the way back to the days of the Canaanites and the Amalekites. Uh, even today, dare I say, Hollywood, politicians, celebrities, pastors, ministers, evangelists. And you know, John Ramirez shares an interesting story in one of his preachings. He gives the story of a preacher one time who got mad at a hotel because they lied to him and they didn't book uh, the rooms that he requested for all his pastors. And he calls the hotel clerk a 
liar, a deceiver. And then she says, oh, really? Because I have a list of all your pastors and ministers that ordered pornography movies. You get the picture? Mm -hmm. It's been going on. Now, this is also a conditioning technique. To the point where a parent will see their kid watching a show indulging in homosexuality or some type of sin, and they don't think twice about it. They just let their kids sink it in. This is the road it's on, acceptance. It's so normal, it's so popular, you don't even think about it. You don't bat an eye, and you don't say anything. I see this rampant at the community college that I go to, and all of these professors, it seems like they're in some type of conspiracy to push this agenda. We know that this agenda is the prince of the air, Satan, the devil, trying to push it. Now, my third point, they want, they want to make you so numb to it that you forget your own sins are still there. Sin is gonna be the trademark of the world Anti-God is going to be the trademark of the world. Sin, that's going to be your prized possession. Your flesh loves it so much. You don't have to die to yourself. There's a reason why in 1 Corinthians 15 it says, no flesh and blood can enter the kingdom of heaven. The heart is wicked and it's not to be trusted. Your soul is what needs righteous cleansing. Now, I want to make a point here as well. Yes, our sins are there. Yes, there are sins are there, and everyone's is. It's not just pedophiles. It's not just homosexuals. It's you. It's me. Second Corinthians five fifteen through seventeen. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. God is not a repairman. He doesn't fix up the old you. When the Bible talks about a new heart, it's not the old heart regenerated. It's a completely new heart, a completely new spirit, a completely new soul, mind, and body. If it was just the old one fixed up, it would eventually deteriorate again. We died to that. It doesn't exist anymore. We have temptations. Yet who is the name we're given to be a way to deviate from those temptations? Who's going to always give you a way out? Jesus. There's Amen. one name, and that's right. There's one name. This agenda has no weight on the gospel. This agenda has no weight on the plan of God. Yet, just like Jose said, it's time that the church speak up. I know I saw on a YouTube video once, just real quick. There was um, a theological uh, Christian apologist who was debating a cosmic skeptic, and the, the apologist said that colleges are a breeding ground for atheists and skeptics. And then someone commented and said, yeah, that's just college education. However, oh, that's a smirky comment. This is not education. It's actually anti-education. Because it's the absence of a Christian voice that lets evil prevail. It's the absence of what God gave you. God didn't call you to be silent and sit down. Where you right now. He called you to stand up in his army. What happens to armies and soldiers who fall asleep on watch? These masks are not spiritual representations. 
We're supposed to be outspoken. We're supposed to be the light. And you're responsible for all the opportunity that you can have to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Every person that you see is either on a path to heaven or to hell. There's no in between. And I heard a quote once that said, how much hate do you have to have for someone to know that eternal life is possible and not tell them? God tells us to watch in these times. If I can get the worship team back. God tells us to watch in these times. Yes, there is a specific agenda. There's a specific educational system trying to be infused into children, into young people, into college students, and uh, adults are professing this agenda as well. However, God also teaches us to love, and to give, and to share with grace and humility. Because when Christ died, and his feet on that cross, everybody is under those feet. There's no one better than what Jesus did. I don't need to be saved. I don't need to be saved. I don't need that. I just don't feel like I need salvation. Are you better? Are you trying to say you're better than what Jesus did on the cross? We're all beneath that cross. And we all need to kneel to that man, that son, that God. Salvation is the key. We don't just want to condemn. We don't just want to give justice. But God is eternally just and eternally merciful. We must give love and mercy at the same time. And it's such a beautiful picture that I picture the cross. Eternal justice and eternal love was thus fulfilled on that cross. Don't give people what they deserve. Because God didn't give to you. Give people love. Give the gospel and humility. I want to close this in prayer. And I want us to realize that. I want to stress this really well so that you can leave thinking about it, hopefully. This book of Revelation is not just the end of the Bible, it's real, it's serious, it's happening. And you know, what happens to the people who stay silent, who sit down, knocked over easily is what happens. Stand firm to this gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. You can fire your hands and close your eyes with me. Heavenly Father, we only seek to know you. Paul tells us we were dead, not struggling for life. We were dead already. But when you called our name, we ran out of that grave. There's only one name that can do that for somebody. There's only one name that can fight and battle and war this agenda with love. That name was the name of your son that came to this earth and died. For every single person, no matter their sin, no matter their struggle, that every person here today would go home with something that has convicted them. Something that they must give up. Something that they must confess because we're all hindered. We're all withholding it. I pray for your love and steadfastness with our church today. In the name of Jesus, your Son, the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God. Thank you, brother, for that word. I love pastors who don't always bring messages that tickle your ears or my ears, but brings messages that allows the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins, allows the Holy Spirit to correct us. King David said, Lord, I love your correction. And I know, I know he didn't say that with a, a smile on his face. That was a tough one. King David was reprimanded by a prophet because of his adultery. But he was very thankful that God brought it to his attention so that he could ask God to forgive him for that sin. Ask God to forgive him for those sins. So this morning, I want to continue my brother's prayer. 
and bow our heads it for a moment here. Because Paul the Apostle addresses the fact that some of us were just like what our brother was preaching about this morning. Some of us had of these tendencies, this sinfulness about us. I know that uh, I grew up in a home, and, and I'm not blaming the home, but I saw all that stuff. And uh, saw myself being a spitting image of that by the time I was 16, 17 years of age. And some of you have had these sins be our temptation, be our old flesh, our old nature. So as I just say a quick prayer, um, and then we'll sing the last song. Say, speak to God how you wish. Father, we, come, we came to church here this morning to worship you and to praise you and to, to hear your word, but also hoping that a fire would be lit in our hearts, in our spirits, to cause us to return to our first love for you. When we first found you, we were so devoted to you. We were so um, unselfish in our life and of giving it to you. We surrendered everything. And I know that I have fallen away from that first love on and off, on and off again in situations. And with my brothers and sisters here this morning, I ask that you forgive me and light the fire again in our hearts and our lives. We pray for the body of Christ in the United States of America especially, where we have allowed this subtlety, this slow moving of the enemy to infiltrate the people that you died for, to infiltrate our lives. Wash us in the blood of Jesus, I pray. Lord God, help us start fresh and new with you this morning. Help us dedicate our lives fresh and new with, uh, with uh, a made of mind that when we walk out of here today, we're going to live for Jesus. We're going to stand up to the crowd that is trying to push us in one direction. With the as Paul the Apostle prayed, he asked that the church, pray that I will have the courage. We pray for that courage this morning. Lord God. We praise you now and thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 sing this last song. It's called How Can I Keep From Singing?
dismiss. Um, I like the point that Bo just brought up. We carry the sword. A, a sword is not dull. Amen. It cuts deep, dividing flesh and bone and the soul. This is the sword we're supposed to carry, the sword of truth. Um, like I said, there's an offering, a uh, little bucket in the back if you want to give. I'm not sure where it went, but there's a love offering for... I have it, the card. Oh, you have it? Okay. Yeah. If anybody else wishes to sign it, it's for uh, Pastor Jose. Uh, Sunday. 